Welcome to my Pokemon Emerald Hardcore Nuzlocke walkthrough, the first big series on this channel. In this series, we will be doing a hardcore Nuzlocke of the base game of Pokemon Emerald. I've put a link in the description below with the full rule set that I use, but in short, in addition to the standard Nuzlocke rules, playing on set mode, no items in battle except for held items, and we'll be playing with level caps for each gym leader and the Pokemon League. This series is going to be so much more than just your average playthrough though. In fact, I wanted to design this playthrough to be more like a guide than just simply the best moments from the Nuzlocke. I'll include some random thoughts and some remarks along the way to hopefully make the experience a little more entertaining. But generally speaking, I want the majority of the moments you see in my playthrough to be helpful in your own journey. And by doing this, I myself hope to become a better Nuzlocker as well by learning from the mistakes I make in the process. Encounters, battles, victories, and wipes. The road from Gen 3 casual to Emerald Master starts here. Let's do this. You know, I never will get over the fact that my parents just threw me in the back of a box truck on the way to our new home. I feel like more of a hostage than a son. Quickly change our options here, set tech speed to fast, turn battle scene off for now, although I might turn it on for boss fights later. It just helps make the grind faster. And of course, we want to be on set mode. Huh, figure offs are a lot bigger than I thought they would be. Gotta make sure we grab this potion upstairs as well. I always like how you could just barge into anyone's house in this game as if it was totally fine. Yeah, May's mom is just like, who the fuck? Oh, it's just another child. I guess that's fine. And I've got nothing to say about it, apparently. Nah, you look like you got this under control. Okay, starter selection. If you are trying to maximize your chances of success in your run, you always, always, always pick Mudkip. Mudkip is actually utterly insane in this game, arguably the best Pokemon that you can use for this Nuzlocke in general. The other options are both solid as well though, but definitely have much more downside to them. Sceptile is awesome in the late game, but Grovile is rough to use throughout the entire early and mid game. And the Torchic line is actually the opposite. Blaziken is not as great in the late game, as this generation is fairly biased against fire types in general, but Combustion is very solid in the early and mid game. Since I want to make this run a little bit more interesting for myself, I'm gonna go with Trico for my first attempt. I like to spend some time right in the beginning, leveling my starter up to around level eight or so, just to make it easier to go through the trainers ahead, and it makes it a lot safer. Trico is really frail, so. This is a good time to check the nature of my Trico as well. Quiet. Eh, meh. Well, at least we'll hit harder, which is good. Natures aren't everything. Try not to pay attention to them too much. It'll just stress you out. Always make sure you get the free potion from this lady in town in each attempt. Rival battle goes well, as you would expect. Trico went a little bit too hard, but that's fine. Anyone else remember getting the running shoes for the first time back in 2003? That was one of the best feelings I ever had playing Sapphire for the first time. Time for our first couple encounters of the run. Route 101, I do not count personally in my runs because that is technically where you get your starter, and so I count Trico as my encounter for that route. First up is Poochyana on Route 103. Not bad. Mightyana is nice to have super early with Intimidate, gets Bite early, Black Glasses is also available pretty early as well to boost that Bite if we want it. Route 102 is next, and we actually hit the 4% chance on Ross. Holy shit. This run is going to be interesting, although Curlia can be tough to use with how frail she is as well. Plus, Psychic types in general aren't as great in Emerald, with the metric fuck ton of Dark types that are all over the place. It's definitely an interesting pickup, but I definitely think I would have rather had Lotad. I don't want to spend any time leveling either Ralts or Poochyana at this point, as neither of them are great for the first or second gym. But we'll have to see what our next encounters are as we get closer to Rustboro City. After watching Wally get his own Ralts, we're ready for another encounter. Oh, Jesus, that's right. I keep forgetting this guy exists. Yeah, you better be sorry. Our next encounter is Wormpool on Route 104. Not a bad pickup. Will be useful either way for the second gym. I spent the time to switch train him now so that we can have a second usable team member. Ends up being a Cascoon, which is absolutely huge. Dustox is definitely preferred over Beautifly in every scenario. Brawly is now essentially going to be a totally free, as well as Norman slacking. I'll talk about that more when we get there. Now for the Petalburg Woods encounter, and it's a slack off. Jesus Christ, I'm getting all the rare encounters this run so far. Slacking can be an okay late game Pokemon based on what I've read, but he's just very finicky to use. Only being able to attack every other turn just requires a lot of planning ahead. Vigoroth may be okay to use though for the time being, we'll see. 
Silk Scarf Boosted Strength does sound pretty decent. I sweep up the rest of the trainers in Petalburg Woods, and in the process I evolve my Cascoon into Dustox. He'll be integral in my fight against Brawly at the second gym. But for now, I do need to dump my experience into at least one other Pokemon so I don't go over the first gym's level cap of 15 with my Trico. Ah yes, a grown man cowering behind a 10 year old, a staple for most Pokemon games. Finally in Rustboro. Ah, the Cutter's house. Sounds like a place I should enter without supervision. We need a couple of more levels for our Trico before we go into the first gym, so we're going to head to Route 116 to the northeast to farm some trainer battles and pick up our next two encounters as well. Before you do head out there though, make sure you bring one repel with you so that you can run through all of this grass without getting your encounter just yet. We want to get our guaranteed Wismer encounter first from Wismer Cave at the end of this route. This is because there is a chance you can get a Wismer as your encounter on Route 116. And if that happens, you've basically wasted an encounter, which we definitely do not want to do, especially considering that Taylor was a possible encounter on this route. All right, now that we have sacrificial fodder for later, Let's see what we get on Route 116. Jesus freaking Christ. All right, well, here goes nothing. <laughs> oh, jeez. All right. Wow. Ralts and now Abra. These actually aren't that great of encounters, especially because I am also not playing with trade evolutions this run, so this encounter is basically really bad. I already have Dustox to sweep Brawly and Kadabra isn't very useful anywhere else, but this is just ridiculous. So far, our future Watson fight is looking kind of sketch, I'm not gonna lie. With the super early game finally out of the way, it's time to take on Roxanne. So I equip an Orenberry to both Trico and Dustox, and I head in. After absorbing several Geodudes, we begin the battle with Roxanne. She leads with two Geodudes as well, which are swiftly absorbed like the others. But then her ace comes out. A lot of people take this Pokemon for granted, but they shouldn't. Roxanne is not a free fight with Trico. Far from it. I start out with an Absorb that barely does any damage, and Roxanne quickly follows up with a Rock Tomb that takes out nearly half of my HP. You see that? That's what you call not free. And we get a speed drop as well, so we're speed tied now. Luckily, Roxanne's AI is awful, and so Nose Pass ends up going with a useless Harden in the next turn. But what scares me more was the next move, Block. Well, you better bring this one home, buddy, cause you're stuck now. After the potion, I was actually sweating quite a bit. This was not looking good if she chose to spam Rock Tomb instead of Tackle. Well, that ended up being a huge fucking if, because guess what? She didn't use Rock Tomb. Once she was out of potions, Nosepass just spammed Tackle over and over again for some reason, throwing the entire battle and giving us our first gym badge. First boss completed, and our Trico evolved as well. Don't forget to pick up the Quick Claw from the Trainer School. I probably should have picked that up as soon as I entered Rustboro, but oh well. Now that we've beaten Roxanne, we have to go help a grown adult again. In the process, we'll mow over some of these other trainers on Route 116 now that we have cut, which we have taught to our slack off for the time being. Afterwards, it's time to help two adults by getting the Devon Goods back from a weirdo dressed as a sailor and save Pico in the process. I gotta be honest, buddy. I only went in there to save Pico. Now the guy that we helped twice now has taken me to his boss, whom asks me for another favor. Normally that would really grind my gears, but delivering this letter actually comes with an amazing reward, the experience share. Getting the experience share so early in this generation is just really nice. On our way out of Rustboro City, your rival will stop you and force you to give them your number. Just be careful not to click too fast through this like I did, as they will ask you if you want a battle at the end of the conversation. This battle is totally optional and you can say no, but if you do want the XP and the money and you're confident everything will go fine then go for it. Quick ride on Mr. Briney's boat and wow call from my father that's rare. You seem to be doing fine. Okay, bye. Thanks, Dad. As soon as you get to Dooford, you're going to want to pick up a couple of items right away. The house located right next to the dock will have an ace trainer in there that will give you a silk scarf for free. Really awesome early game item to have, and it should work out nicely once our slack off evolves. You're then going to, of course, want to talk to the fisherman in town as well to pick up your first fishing rod. This is very important for the two guaranteed encounters we are about to pick up. We can start fishing right in the town itself, and we get ourselves a Magikarp. Garros is always a welcome encounter in any Nuzlocke you play where he's available, and this 
this generation is no different. Although I will say his moveset is unfortunately awful in this game as well. We'll be using Tackle and Bite to kill things for quite a while. Since this was before the physical special split, Bite is special in this generation, which isn't as good. Heading north to fish on Route 106, and we get ourselves a guaranteed tentacle encounter. Since I play with Dupe's Claws in my rule set, I can just keep ignoring all the other magic harps that show up until I get one. Well, never mind. Another quick tip, especially for lower level encounters you get, don't get greedy. Just throw the fucking Pokeball when its HP is a bit higher, if not full. Not getting that tentacle sucks. It's very possible we really needed that for the fourth gym. I guess we'll have to come up with something else. We're going to head into Granite Cave first so we can get another encounter and do some training. But before you do, make sure you pick up the hidden Stardust and Pokeball on the beach. Stardust is very nice for some extra cash. We'll pick up Flash from this guy as soon as we walk into the cave. And our next encounter is... Makuhita it is then. I literally just talked about this, Jesus fucking Christ. Dustox, you need to chill out, bro. Don't ever do what I just did with those last two encounters. Just make sure you have enough Pokeballs on you and just throw them until you catch them. Now we are really gonna have a rough time. I progressed through the remainder of Granite Cave without Flash. If you need help with this, just look up the map of the cave online. We want to deliver the letter to Steven first, so we can then go back to Rustboro City and pick up that experience share now. It just makes grinding so much easier and faster. On my way out of the cave, Dustox hits level 17 and learns Protect. If you do have a Dustox, do not skip this. Protect is a very powerful move, especially for dealing with slacking in the 5th gym. I ran all the way back to Rustboro so I could pick up the experience share from Mr. Stone at the Devon Corporation. Like I said, this detour is very well worth it. Running all the way back to Dufer Town, and with Dustox we are ready to absolutely wreck Brawly and the second gym. The extra experience going to my other Pokemon will be very nice. I have a lot of Pokemon that I'll need to level up, so I'll be putting my grinding hat on shortly. If you do need help with grinding locations and how to level your Pokemon faster in general in Ruby, Sapphire, or Emerald, check out my grinding guide listed in the description below. It should really help, especially with all the handheld players. Finally at Brawly, let's get this over with. I actually completely forgot about Seismic Toss. This fight with Machop actually got kind of hairy for a minute, forcing me to use my berry and everything, but eventually he goes down. Meditite is up next, and he is free no matter which Pokemon you are using. Just make sure you're using a 100% accurate attacking move. The only damaging move this Meditite has is Focus Punch, which requires the user not to be hit by an attack in order for it to go off. With Poison up and a bunch of gusts later, he finally goes down. And now, it's just Dustox versus Brawly's ace, Makuhita. And this was quite simple. Just spam Confusion until he goes down. I got pretty lucky with the Confusion procs, but that really wouldn't have mattered, honestly. He would have gone down regardless. And with that, badge number two is ours, as well as the TM for Polk Up, which may very well come in handy for us at some point later on. Now that the second gym is finally complete, it's time for some grinding. With the next gym leader being one of the more notoriously difficult ones in the game, I'm going to need a pretty filled up team to take him on, especially since I didn't end up going with Mudkip from the start. Luckily, we do have a lot of trainer fights on the way to Mauville City. We'll start with the trainers on the beach outside of Slayport. Once you get there, make sure you pick up the soft sand from this little girl on the beach. Another nice type boosting item. Also be sure to clear out the soda pop house on the beach as well. You get free soda pop and it allows you to buy even more afterwards. Soda pop restores your Pokemon's HP by 60 and it's half the price of a super potion, which is huge. Definitely load up on as much of these as you can while you're here. After healing up at the Slateport Pokemon Center, it's time to look for Captain Stern to deliver the Devon goods. After talking to... Doc, I can then head over to the museum to pick up the Thief TM, take out a few Team Aqua Grunts, and finally deliver the Devon goods, which will subsequently open up Route 110 to the north and our next encount. Uh, can I help you? You think we're gonna become good friends, huh? Nothing more unsettling than a grown adult forcing his phone number upon a child. Anyway. Back to Route 110 in my encounter. Looks like a Gulpin. And don't worry, I've learned my lesson from last time. I hope. The Gulpin is captured, and it's not a bad encounter to be honest. Swallet is much better than people think. Early Sludge, Body Slam, Toxic via level up is really awesome, and it gets the stockpile package later on as well. Gulpin himself isn't so great though, so we'll probably have to wait until after we get through Watson before we can use him. Poochiana evolving is huge for us right now, as we are really going to need some help against our rival in Watson. I'm particularly worried about our rival since all three of our usable Pokemon are weak to her ace, Combusken. I'm going to look to do some more grinding now, so I can give myself the best chance of getting out of here with no casualties. Unfortunately, Route 110 is the best place to do this at the moment, and it's not very fast. 
I'll see you guys in a bit. After some time later, I feel like I'm ready to take on the rival fight on Route 110. Be sure to prepare for this fight as it is definitely one of the more challenging ones. I lead in with my Grovile to take out her Wingle. This is so I can bait her Combuskin out next. Although, I did not think Wing Attack would deal that much damage to me, and I also didn't think that Quick Attack would not hit that hard. Seriously, it's a fucking Wingle for Christ's sake. This was totally miscalculated on my part, but this is just another reason why I don't like Grovile in these games. The Combuskin comes out next as expected, so I switched into Mightyana to intimidate him, expecting an Ember or Peck to come out on my Grovile. This was a big fucking mistake, because since Grovile was in kill range for literally any of Combuskin's moves, the move was chosen at random, and it just so happened to be Double Kick. The absolute worst possible scenario for me. This is going terribly. I switch into Dust Tox next, which was my plan from the beginning, to tank a double kick, except he used focus energy instead. I've got a long ass way to go as far as understanding the AI of this game. I use Protect just to see what Combuskin would use, and it looks like it's Ember. I don't really have a choice here. I need to just start hitting this thing with some confusions. I want to try to save my Dust Ox for later if I can, so I switch into Mightyena again to try to lower Combuskin's attack stat some more. Maybe one of my other Pokemon can take a Peck or a Double Kick if I lower his attack stat enough. Now that my Mightyena is nearly dead, it looks like it's about time for our first sacrifice of the run, and it has to be Abra, unfortunately. I am such a fucking idiot. I should have brought Wismer to this fight, to use as the strategic sacrifice instead, but I totally forgot. At this point, I don't really have any options. I'm just going to throw Dustox into the fight one last time to see if I can get lucky with a confusion. Unfortunately, it's just barely not enough to take Combuskin out, and Dustox goes down. I send Grovile in to finish the chicken off with a quick attack. But wait, there's more! I thought I would be cruising the rest of this fight, but no! After some back and forth with Lombre, he gets a fucking crit swift on my Grovile, and just like that, three of my party members are dead after I just said I would do everything I could to get out of this without any casualties. I finish the fight with Mighty Anna, and my rival finally goes down. I deserve an award? I really don't feel like it may. This is what poor preparation and underestimation looks like in a hardcore Nuzlocke. You need to have a plan and have a clear mind. What I should have done was spent the time to level up my Magikarp into a Gyarados and my Slackoth into a Vigoroth. It would have taken a long time, but that would have given me the options I needed in order to get by easily. But my laziness got the best of me. I know grinding really, really sucks. Trust me, I get it but you just saw the results. Being underleveled or not having the amount of team members you should will always, always come back to bite you in the ass. Don't make these mistakes that I have. Do not take the rival fight on Route 110 lightly. And with that, this episode is now over. But the attempt isn't. I may have lost my starter, but I still have pieces that I know I can work with that I know can push this run much farther than this. But in order to get back on my feet, there's gotta be a lot of grinding ahead of me. Luckily, there are a bunch of trainers that open up at this point as well as the daycare, which is the first alternative grinding method for Pokemon Emerald. If you're interested in how that works, check out that grinding video I mentioned earlier in the description below. I'll be referring back to it myself before the next episode, because I'm going to need it. By then, I'll have a new team ready to go to take on Watson and the new routes that open up. As you can see, I've grinded up basically the majority of the Pokemon I actually have left in order to minimize my chances of losing any others. Although Watson may be pretty tough with this lineup, we'll see. I'm not going to bother leveling up the Ralts yet, as Curlia isn't very helpful most of the time. I'd rather wait until I can have the Gardevoir. While I was grinding, I spent the time taking out the trainers on Route 118 and 117 to the east and west of Mauville. By the way, make sure you pick up that hard scale on Route 118 for later. I picked up the HM for Rock Smash, the Coin Case, which will be very helpful later on, and of course, the Mock Bike. I chose the Mock Bike because it'll help a lot with any future grinding we have to do using the daycare method. Now that all that stuff is out of the way, it's time to get my Route 117 encounter. With how my team is currently constructed, I really want every available option I can get right now, just to be safe. And it's an Illumise. Yikes. I was really hoping for an Oddish there. Illumise does get Charm and Encore at some point, but I just don't think any of that is going to contribute well to the Watson fight. Oh well, we'll use what we have. Before we face Watson though, I want to head over to Verdant Turf Town to pick up the Attract TM and the Black Glasses from the other side of Wismer Cave. That should help Mighty Anna out a little bit. Now back in Malvo City, and I think we're ready to take on the gym, but not before we wreck Wally's shit and his confidence. Oh 
Well, I'd say you more than just lost that one, buddy. After clearing out the gym, I'm ready for Watson. I have some interesting strategies for this one, so let's get to it. The primary strategy for the fight is simple. Spam bulk up with my Vigor up on his Voltorb until he's beefy enough to sweep Watson, cut, and rock smash. At least that's what I hope happens. I opened up the fight with Watson with exactly that strategy at first. I have a ton of back and forth with Voltorb in the process, constantly bulking up, slacking off when I need health, all while fighting paralysis. Eventually I get to the point where I feel like I can start swinging, so I hit cut and Voltorb goes down. Electrite comes out next, I give Vigoroth some more health first before another cut brings down the little pup as well. Magneton comes out, and this was one of the ones I was worried about. Even with all the bulk ups, Rock Smash still doesn't even hit for half health, but even with a defense drop, a second Rock Smash is still not enough to bring Magneton down. I have to send in Gulpin to try and get a yawn off if I can, and luckily I do after the Super Potion from Watson. Since he used Supersonic last, I tried to go for an Encore before switching Vigoroth back in, and it worked, just in case he woke up early. With Vigoroth back in, the idea now is to slack off and then continue to go for Rock Smashes. It takes quite a lot of effort, and I had to take a bunch of risks here, but luckily Magneton only used Sonic Boom for the most part, which really helped me eventually bring him down. I actually had to make him fall asleep again before I could even get in enough damage, but now out comes his ace, Manectric. This is where I was going to need a little bit of luck, but I thought I had a decent strategy for this. Keyword there, thought. I'm about to make another big mistake. I sent out Illumise as my strategic sacrifice so I can cleanly switch in Mightyana. Now the idea here was win a 1v1 by using Thief to steal my Nectric Citrus Berry, hopefully giving me enough of an advantage to take him out. And maybe that would have worked if I wasn't a fucking idiot and equipped Black Glasses to my Mightyana before the fight because I thought it would be nice to have a little extra damage for a bite. For those of you planning on using Thief to steal a berry from a gym leader's ace, just remember to make sure that your Pokemon isn't holding any items first. I went for the Thief twice actually because I was confused as to why it didn't work the first time. I thought that maybe my HP had to be lower and then the berry would be eaten right away, but no, that's not how it works, I'm just dumb. Ah, oh, fuck man. It was over and I knew it. There was no way any of my other Pokemon were standing up to Manectric, and one by one, everyone fell. There are definitely a handful of important lessons that we can learn from this first attempt, but focus and preparation are definitely among the most important. Have a plan before every boss fight, and not just a loose one either. Try to imagine how every single turn could play out. Imagine something going wrong too, and then how you would deal with it. Attempt number one is officially over. A lot of mistakes were made, but a lot of lessons were learned as well. Attempt number two starts right now. I won't bore you with a lot of the details we already covered in the walkthrough so far up to Watson, so I'll only go over the encounters and the major fights. You know what? I think I'll be a girl this time, why not? That's probably why I lost the first attempt, honestly. I also left Battle Scene on for this run too. It's more fun to watch the battle animations. I decided to go with Trico again. I can't accept the way that he went down in the first attempt. Ooh, a rash Trico as well, hell yeah. First two encounters ended up being a Poochiana and a Wormpole. Again, both counters are totally fine. Anything the Wormpole turns into will be very nice for Brawly, and it looks like another Dust Tox to me. Our next encounter past Petalberg is a Meryl. Not bad. Unfortunately, it does have Thick Fat instead of Huge Power, but that's not the end of the world. Even with Thick Fat, Azumaro can still be a great addition to the team in a lot of ways. She'll be really, really nice for Flannery, actually, and we'll need that because our starter will be useless in that gym. But yeah, regardless of ability, Azumaro is a great Pokemon. It evolves super early, and bulky water types in general are just great. Our Petalburg Woods encounter is Shroomish, and thank the fucking lord. These encounters are actually so much better than what we got in the first attempt. Breloom in general is a fantastic Pokemon, with excellent offensive capabilities, you get him so early. Typing is very unique and very strong for this generation, and I'm very excited. With how this team is currently constructed, we are going to have a much, much easier time on the first four gyms. Trico and Shroomish on Roxanne, Dustox on Brawly, Breloom on Watson, and Azumarill on Flannery so far. Looking good. Moving on to Rustboro, we do our usual stuff. Pick up Cut and Quick Claw, and then immediately head to Route 116 to grind up some trainers and pick up our next two encounters. We used a Repel, of course, so we can get all the way to the Wismer Cave first to pick up our first strategic sacrifice. And then let's see what we get on Route 116. Shit. 
Oh, God. Well, the cool part about this is Skiddy is a rare encounter, but the very not so cool part of it is that it sucks really, really bad. Delcaddy is unfortunately not a good Pokemon in basically any scenario whatsoever. Bad stats, bad learn set. It gets a ton of coverage later on, but you have to actually use your TNs to get that coverage, which you will not do, or at least I hope to God you don't. At least our encounters have been excellent so far, and I haven't killed any accidentally. With all of that settled, I very quickly dispose of Roxanne, courtesy of Shroomish. Leech Seed Absorb is just too good. We go help a couple of adults again. Mr. Stone gives me a letter to deliver it to his son again, even though he literally just gave me a device that supports phone calls, but I'm a little girl, so what the fuck do I know? And we head off to Doofer Town. After getting there, I quickly pick up the Silk Scarf from the house by the dock, and then the Old Rod, and then I pick up my next two encounters, Magikarp and Tentacool. Both great guaranteed encounters, just don't kill them. <laughs> Back to Granite Cave to get our next encounter, and it's a Zubat. Back to the awesome encounters. Sweet. Crobat is really, really good in any game, honestly. Incredibly fast and has an amazing defensive typing. He'll do great for us. Pick up Flash, deliver the letter to Steven, and then haul our asses back to Rustboro so we can pick up the experience share from Mr. Stone. Run all the way back to Duford, do some more grind to make sure Dustox is prepared. Also want to make sure my treat goes at least to grow by as well. And it's time to face Brawly again. And luckily, I think we can pretty much get away with exactly what we did last time. And there was not a whole lot to see here as we blew through all three of his Pokemon much easier than last time. Dustox just makes this fight super safe and just so much easier to get through. We get Bulk Up again, which might come in handy later. And now it's time to move on to Slateport again. I'm definitely flying through this attempt much faster than the first. It becomes pretty easy to plow through everything when you know where all the items are, what each trainer and boss has, and what your encounters are capable of. Once again, do not skip out on the Seashore House. Soda Pop is very, very valuable. Kills more than Super Potions for half the price. After delivering the Devon Goods again and using my childlike superpowers to cause a dozen or so criminals to clear out of a museum, we can head north to Route 110 to pick up our next encounter. And it's a huge pickup. Electric is a fan fantastic encounter for Emerald. Electric types are just so good in this game, especially later on. Metric is going to be an excellent addition to the team. I cannot wait to start raining thunderbolts down on bosses later on. Now the next step is of course our rival fight, which went really terribly last time. I will not be lazy this time. I'm leveling up as much as I need to to make sure I don't lose half of my party again. It's going to take a while, but it makes sense. After a while later, finally done with the grind, and now I feel confident enough to go into this rival fight without losing anybody. Always prepare for this rival fight, by the way. In my opinion, it is the hardest rival fight in the entire game, easily. Make sure you have a plan, make sure you have your strategic sacrifices in place, berries are equipped, everything. All right, let's do this right. Take a quick look at my team before heading into the fight. Everyone is leveled up and having Azumarill should definitely help with the Combuskin this time, as well as the Berloom, honestly, just because of how hard he hits. I start out with Berloom because I know he'll one-shot the Wingle and the Combuskin will come out. I honestly should have just switched it to Azumarill at this point, but I thought I could sneak in a Leech Seed before I did. Peck ended up dealing a lot more than I thought it would, Although, I'm not so sure a crit would have killed us there anyway. It could have been a range though, I suppose. With Azumarill now switched in, I thought I was in a pretty good spot. However, I kind of had another why the hell did I do that kind of moment, and decided that Rollout would be better than Water Gun. This was dumb. Even if Rollout would deal more damage in the long run, this Combuskin crit me a few times, and I could have easily lost Azumarill because I was locked into using Rollout for basically the rest of the fight. Luckily, my rival starter goes down, and luckily again, my Rollout doesn't miss on the incoming Lombre either, because if it did, I probably would have lost Azumarill. I dodged another bullet there. Azumarill is really, really important for me to have against Flannery at this point, so I don't want to lose him just yet. And that's the rival fight. No deaths, but I definitely still made a few dumb decisions there that I didn't need to make. All part of the process. Back in Mauville, we quickly do all the usual. Obtain a disc that allows us to smash rocks, pick up a special case that fuels our gambling addiction, grab the Zoomy bike, and brutally murder a little boy's pet. I already took care of the majority of the grind in the last video, so I'm basically all ready to go for Watson's gym. I feel much more confident with Berloom and Dustox on the team. I actually ran some damage calculations this time as well to get a general idea of how hard his Pokemon hit, and I think I'm in a very good position to win this without too many problems. Let's see how it goes. I'm ready. I lead with Grovile to slowly take out the Voltorb and the Electrike, because with his moveset, he's not going to be able to do too much against Magneton and Manectric anyway. But against the smaller guys, he's great. 
He has the type advantage defensively, which allows me to use Absorbs to keep his health up. And after some back and forth and a super potion later, both of the little guys finally go down. I always wondered why Watson always sends in his Electrike second, though. I feel like Magneton would be his best option. I'm not complaining. Magneton does finally come out, and this is where Berloom truly shines in this fight. Steel types are always so hard to deal with, but especially when they show up this early in the game. Having a great fighting type so early in the game to counter this is just awesome. After I clear the paralysis with my cherry berry, I start going for the mock punches, which I calculated would easily two-shot Magneton no matter what. This is a great scenario, because it also means I won't deal enough damage to trigger a super potion from Watson. Magneton goes down easily, and now it is just his ace, Manectric, the one who wiped us out last time. With Berloom at full health, I decided to go for a Leech Seed, as Manectric wasn't going to deal that much damage right off the bat. And I hit it. From there, I'm just looking to deal as much damage as possible until I need to switch into Dustox. Dustox is actually very well equipped to deal with Manectric, having pretty bulky special defense stat, and you can teach a thief to take that Citrus Berry away if you want. However, something happened that I didn't really think about. Manectric started spamming Howl over and over again, which actually kind of makes sense now that I'm thinking about it, because his electric type moves would be resisted by my grass type. I will admit, it got a little scary at one point. I was concerned about how much damage Quick Attack would do with all those attack boosts. But luckily, with the help of Leech Seed, it wasn't enough to put me in serious danger. And eventually, Balloon takes him out. Winning us the third badge. That went so much better than last time. But it wasn't just the improved encounters. I did a lot more prep for this fight than I did in the last run, and I've made a lot less mistakes. With Watson now vanquished and my Pokemon healed back up, I head over to my PC box to pull out some Pokemon that I'll need for the next fight. Flannery. Tentacool and Gyarados should be excellent additions to the team. I'm also boxing Dustox for the time being, as I really want to keep him for Norman when we get to him. You'll see why when we get there. From here, I start the grind towards Flannery in the fourth gym. As I start mowing over trainers on Route 117, we pick up our next encounter, and it's an Oddish. Very nice. Bioplume is an average Pokemon overall, nothing too special, but definitely not bad. Blossom, on the other hand, is awesome, especially later on in the game against all those water-type trainers and boss fights. Very bulky, resists a lot of stuff later on in the game. Gets Magical Leaf, which is nice against Wands Kingdra as well. Cool. After doing all the boring stuff in Verdant Turf and getting strength, we can start heading north. I stop by the Winstraight house and wreak havoc on an entire family to pick up the Macho Brace. Not a bad item for a little bit of EV training here and there. A little further north and we can start picking up some more encounters. First up is Numbel on Route 111. Not the best, unfortunately. Camera up is actually quite nice to have against three of Winona's Pokemon if I want him there as an option. But outside of that, he's not very good, unfortunately. Bad typing for his generation, basically useless after Winona for the most part. Next is our encounter on Fiery Path, and it's a Torkoal. Very interesting Pokemon, but unfortunately also not a very good encounter in my opinion. Outside of Gen 3, Torkoal is actually probably really good. He's really bulky, he gets Protect via level up, and definitely pretty underrated, I think. But in these games, Fire types just struggle a lot after the 6th gym, basically all the way up until the end of the game. On Route 113, we run into a Spinda. Again, not really all that useful. Really cool gimmick in Teeter Dance and Dizzy Punch, but the stats are just horrendously bad. Might be a fun experiment, though. I want to take some time to talk about your average trainer for a second, especially as it pertains to this route specifically. When you are nuzlocking in any game in the series, do not take random trainer battles for granted. Each game has a small handful of casual overworld trainers trainers that will actually kill you if you are not paying attention. For Emerald, this route in particular, Route 113, is quite dangerous. There are a couple of ninja boys that have coughings with self-destruct, as well as a ninjas with sand attack and fury swipes, and I believe there's also a bird keeper towards the end of the route that has a swallow as well, along with a skarmory. There are other trainers that are very dangerous in this generation as well overall, which I'm sure I'll talk about later. If you're interested in learning all the random trainer battles in this game that could potentially end your run, or at least take out some of your party members, take a look at my five essential tips video for Emerald Nuzlocke linked in the description below. Tip number two goes over a bunch of these trainers to look out for. 
before in this game. Moving through Valibur Town, be sure to stop by the Fossil Maniac's house to pick up the TM for Dig. A very nice move, especially for Flannery. Now on Route 114, we get yet another encounter. Lots of encounters around this spot in the game. And it's a sweet one with Lombre. Lombre himself really sucks, especially in the middle of the game, and you don't get Ludicolo until pretty late, but it is 1000% worth it because Ludicolo is so freaking good in these games, especially in Emerald. Great against Juan and the entire Elite Four, basically. A really awesome pickup overall, but he will live in the box for quite a while. You know, I never really taken a good look at Lynette's place. She claims that it always gets cluttered from all the research she does, but why the hell would you need six computers in 2003? It'll be a good 10 years from now before you can mine any Bitcoin, you know. She doesn't even have a bed or even a chair to sit on. After pointlessly analyzing Lynette's place, we rip through the rest of the trainers on Route 114 and head into Meteor Falls to push the story forward. I personally am repelling through here, so I don't receive an encounter just yet. I want to wait until I pick up a good rod or a super rod and come back later for Barboach, because otherwise I would be getting either Lunatone or Soul Rock because I already have a Zubat on the team. Lunatone and Solrock are both very bad Pokemon and are almost pointless to use anywhere for the most part. Maybe on Winona if you are really lacking options, but outside of that, they're not going to be great at all. Barboach, on the other hand, can evolve into Whiskash, which is overall pretty decent Pokemon. Fantastic typing. It gets an Earthquake at level 36, which is actually just nuts. It's just lacking a little bit in the stat department. And for anyone out there screaming at their screen right now because I'm not coming back later for basically a guaranteed Bagon encounter, I personally ban pseudo-legendary such as Salamence in all of my playthroughs. They are just too insane most of the time and tend to make things a lot easier. With all that being said, if you do not have a Zubat yet, then I would say it's worth the risk and try to get him here. Crobat is a great Pokemon to have. After learning about the mysterious intentions of a bunch of grown adults playing dress up, I decided to do a bit of grinding in Fiery Path to level up my team some more and evolve my Magikarp into Gyarados. He'll be very useful to have in general, but especially for Flannery. After a long grinding session, this is how my team is shaping up at the moment. Looking pretty decent for Gym 4 with these three defensively bulky water types, which should help a lot. And now it's time to scale Mount Chimney and deal with Team Magma. Maxi isn't too difficult, but you still want to have some sort of plan before going in. And make sure your items and berries are equipped and your Pokemon are healed up. And with that, let's take on Maxi. We start the fight with Berloom, which, even with the Intimidate from Mightyana, should have no problem plowing through the Dark Puppy with a couple of Mach Punches. Afterwards, he sends in his camera up next, and so I switch into Gyarados. I go with Gyarados instead of Azumarill just because it's a bit safer, just in case camera up high rolls a magnitude. And I can also get an Intimidate off him as well if I need to switch out Gyarados. Besides, Dragon Rage is actually pretty decent at this stage of the game, and can easily KO the Fire Camel in two hits. And at this point, all that's left is Zubat, which quickly goes down with the strength. That fight was really, really easy this time around. Before we wrap up the episode, there's one more thing I want to make sure I point out before we head into Lava Ridge Town. Do not run past this old lady, man, it, it doesn't matter. Just don't run past this person on your way out of Mount Chimney. They will sell you lava cookies for 200 poke dollars each, and you can buy as many of them as you want. And you're going to want to do exactly that. These lava cookies are literally just full heals for a third of the price. By this point in the game, you should have plenty of money. So go ahead and buy like 30 or 40 of these right now. It's super nice to not have to buy antidotes, paralyze heals, awakenings, etc. for the rest of the game. After the events on top of Mount Chimney, I head south to Route 112, otherwise known as the Jagged Pass, to take out some trainers and get our next encounter. Machop is a very nice pickup, and comes just in time for Norman in the 5th gym. Fighting types in general are pretty decent to have in this generation, and they are particularly hard to come by in this game actually, so this is good. I'm not playing with trade evolutions in this walkthrough though, but honestly the difference between Machamp and Machoke isn't too crazy. They're basically the same, with Machamp just having bigger stats and that's it. Both of them can take a few hits, and they both hit really hard. Both get Guts as well, although it's not as crazy on these guys as it is on Swellow because they're pretty slow. Still nice to have though. Finally in Lava Ridge Town, and what's the first thing we do? Obviously take a few laps around the hot tub of course, and pick up this useless Ice Heal. 
Before we move forward with the fourth gym, there's a couple of quick things to take care of. Firstly, I'm boxing Grovile for this gym, as he's not going to be very helpful at any point, and I don't want to risk losing him. He'll be replaced with a second strategic sacrifice, which are very, very useful, and Flannery in particular, with all of those potential overheats going off. Technically, we can get an encounter in this town by getting an egg from the old lady on the beach, but we are rejecting the offer to take it off her hands. For those of you who don't know, the egg hatches into a why not, which eventually evolves into a Wobbuffet. I personally ban Wobbuffet from my playthroughs, mostly because I just don't enjoy the playstyle it offers. It just feels kind of cheesy and cheap when used correctly. Like, it could win you some battles that maybe you weren't supposed to win, I guess. Just a personal preference, but if you enjoy that playstyle, by all means, pick the little guy up. Also, be sure to stop by the herbal shop in town and grab the charcoal from the old man inside. Type boosting items are always great, even if fire isn't particularly great in this generation. With all of that out of the way, we finally enter the gym, plow through all the fire breathers, and approach Flannery. But before we enter the battle, let's take a look at our team and go over my choices and my thinking. First up, my Tentacool, who should have no issue tearing up Flannery's Numble, Slugma, and potentially Camrupt even. Although, I believe Bubble Beam is a range on that one. But if we take a look at his moves, you'll notice I've added Thief to his arsenal. This is to potentially steal Torkoal's White Herb from him, which will really help us reduce his power level. Next up, we have Azumaro, and Bubble Beam will most likely be what I shoot for in this fight. Rollout has a bigger payoff, but it's just too risky. The biggest strength in Azumaro actually lies in her ability, Thick Fat. While definitely worse than her other ability, Huge Power, Thick Fat is absolutely huge on this fight, allowing us to quad resist fire, turning those overheats into embers basically. Next is Gyarados, and honestly, he's just a really bulky water type, and he's Gyarados. If you, you can't go wrong most of the time with that. And finally, Breloom, who I'm hoping I'll never have to use, but if something goes catastrophically wrong, Breloom should be faster than anything Flannery has, and a single headbutt could save us with how hard this guy hits. And of course, I have two strategic sacrifices here, mostly if we get crit by something and are forced to use some clean switches. This is absolutely the fight to strategically sacrifice Pokemon in. Those overheats are no joke. Throwing weak Pokemon at them to safely switch in your better team members is the way to go. Alright, enough talk. Let's do this. I lead with Tentacool, of course, who I'm expecting to wipe out the majority of her Pokemon. First up is her Numble, which easily gets taken out with a Bubble Beam. Her Slugma comes out next, although I don't know why. Her Torkoal is much stronger and much more equipped to deal with Tentacool, but I guess it's not a big deal. Another Bubble Beam and Slugma is quickly taken care of. Her Camerupt comes out next, and I knew Bubble Beam was going to come close to one-shotting it, but it was unlikely. Still, all I had to endure was either a Tackle or an Overheat. Either one wouldn't have actually done all that much. Actually, now that I'm looking at this, maybe it's a good thing that I wasn't able to one-shot this Camerupt, because now Flannery is just wasting all of her Hyper Potions on it instead of her Torkoal. That's a huge win for us. Speaking of which, her ace finally comes out. I'm not really sure I needed to do this, but I went for a bit of a riskier play here. I knew her Torkoal couldn't take out Tentacool unless she landed a crit, so I decided to risk it and go for the Thief to take away that White Herb while I could, just in case. Luckily, it did work out for me, and Tentacool will get to fight another day. With White Herb now gone, the rest of this fight should be quite simple, assuming I don't get crit several times in a row. I switched in Azumarill next to see if she could take him out one-on-one. -on -one. At first, I thought that this might not have been the most optimal move, Move, as it looked like at that point Torkoal was going to avoid overheating and just spam Body Slam for the rest of the fight. And in those cases, maybe switching in Gyarados would have been better, so I can get the Intimidate off to weaken those Body Slams. However, I forgot that this Torkoal has White Smoke as an ability, which prevents his stats from being reduced. So, actually, I guess this was an accidental good play. <laughs> Luckily, none of it mattered, as Azumara was perfectly capable of taking these body slams as well without much of an issue. Without any hyper potions to worry about, a few bubble beams later, and Torkoal goes down, earning us our fourth badge and the TM for overheat as well. Not bad. With how Azumara was taking those hits, and with Gyarados on deck, I probably didn't need to risk the potential crit on Tentacool there. I'll have to consider those types of scenarios in the future. But for now, things are still running along smoothly.
After exiting the gym, we run into Brendan, who gives us the desert goggles, which will allow us to pick up another encounter before moving on to the fifth gym. He's a real dick about it for some reason, though. I swear, the Gen 3 rival can actually be pretty brutal sometimes. The desert is exactly where we're headed to next, to take out some trainers and pick up that new encounter. And it's only a short walk to the east. This route's music is a fucking jam. Anyone who tells you otherwise is a liar. Time to get our encounter and it's a trap inch. Sweet, very solid encounter. Flygon has great stats, great ability, great typing, gets a ton of coverage, and he's just cool. Never underestimate the cool factor. The only downside is the physical special split, unfortunately. Flygon doesn't learn a lot of physical moves at all in this generation, so he's forced to use his lackluster special attack stat instead most of the time. Still, this is a solid encounter regardless, and we'll definitely consider using him later on. After clearing out the trainers in the desert, which are optional by the way, but if you need the extra experience it's there, there are a few items we can pick up here before we move on. We can get the TM for Sandstorm by going to the southernmost part of the desert, and then heading back north we could pick up a Stardust, a Rare Candy, a Protein, and another Stardust. And with all of that out of the way, it's time to do a bit more grinding for Norman. Not too much at least, as his ace is only a couple levels higher than Flanderns. I'll go over the new team once I get to the gym. The best place to grind, by the way, at this point will still be Fiery Path overall, at least in my experience. After another grinding session, we head back to Petalburg City to face our father for the 5th gym badge. If you need help getting back there, just head south from the desert until you get back to Malville City, head west and take Route 117 until you hit Verdanturf, take Wismer Tunnel and Route 116 back to Rustboro, and then head south and I'm sure you'll recognize your surroundings by that point. Back in Petalburg, and we are ready to take on the 5th gym. But before we start, a word of caution. Treat every single trainer in this gym like a boss fight. Seriously, some of these rooms are extremely terrifying. In particular, the strength room and the crit room. In fact, you may just want to avoid those rooms altogether if you're able to. The strength room in particular has a Zangus with Swords Dance and Slash. That thing is bulky, speedy, and will absolutely wipe out your entire team if you do not take it down quickly. Be very careful here. Don't try to fight them all for extra experience. Just take the quickest path to Norman. I would suggest the entire right side of the gym as it seems to be the least dangerous route to get to him. After navigating through the gym trainers, we're ready to take on our dad. Let's take a look at the team. I'm leading with Azumarill to try to take out Spinda. I have to avoid using Breloom or Machoke for this because Spinda actually has Psybeam, which would not be good for our fighting types. I'm not guaranteed to take out the Spinda with one hit though, as I need to hit it three times with Bubble Beam. I think in order to bring it down. Hopefully we don't get screwed by Teeter Dance. Breloom is all about those mock punches, and will be very useful against Linoon and hopefully Vigoroth as well. It's a two hit KO regardless of which Pokemon comes out. I'm hoping that Linoon actually belly drums as I'm sending Breloom in, because then I can get a free kill essentially without taking any damage. Gyarados has one primary job on this fight, and that's to take one single hit from Norman slacking. This is so I can switch in Dustox cleanly while Slacking's Truant ability prevents it from moving the turn after. Gyarados is the perfect Pokemon to take a hit with that bulky defense stat, especially considering that Intimidate will also soften the blow even further. Machoke is honestly a backup in case something goes wrong on Linoon or Vigoroth, or if Breloom just can't handle both of them. And last, but certainly not least, our Dustox has finally come back to play. Dustox has the most important job of all, taking down Slacking. With the combination of Protect and Poison Sting, Slackings are 100% free. You use Protect when Slacking can attack, and then use Poison Sting during his downturn. Dustox is so underappreciated in these games, and we have our Strategic Sacrifice as well in Wismer in case something goes very, very wrong. Hopefully it won't get to that point. All right, Dad, let's do this. Next up is Vigoroth, and I decide to switch into Breloom on this one. If I could make this choice again though, I would send in Machoke instead to see what he could do. Breloom just took 
way more damage from Facade than I thought he would take, and I ended up risking a critical hit on Slash in order to finish the fight with Berloom instead of somebody else, so I could avoid taking more damage. That could have ended very badly. His Lai Newton comes out next, and now things are a little tricky. I didn't expect to be in this awkward position with Berloom right now. Even though a non-critical hit slash or facade wouldn't kill me, I can't be taking chances like that again if I can help it. So I switch into Machoke to see if he can maybe get one single hit off. Machoke is much more expendable in my opinion, so I feel like I can take a little bit more risks here. Unfortunately, Lainoon lands that crit as Machoke comes in, bringing Machoke's HP way too low to do anything with him. But thank god it wasn't Berloom. This is definitely getting more and more awkward. I decide to use my strategic sacrifice now so I can get a clean switch in of some kind. I was really, really hoping Lainoon would belly drum there, but he didn't. I send in Azumaro next because I believe he can take a hit here. In hindsight, even though I needed Gyarados to take a hit on slacking, I feel like his bulk was big enough to be able to take one hit from Lainoon as well, and maybe that would have been a better move. Not sure though. I go for a bubble beam just to get a little bit of chip damage in, but in the process, Lainoon finally goes for that belly drum. With plus 6 attack now, Lainoon will easily sweep my entire team. I have only one choice here, and that's to make another sacrifice so I can cleanly switch in Berloom. And that sacrifice is going to be Machoke. I know he just joined the team, but in my opinion, he's easily the most expendable Pokemon on this team at the moment. Some may argue Azumaro, but I actually need Azumaro at the next gym. More on that later. With our Machoke falling to Lainoon, we can now switch in Berloom to get off one last priority mock punch to take out the Lainoon once and for all. And now it's just Norman's ace slacking to deal with. Alright Gyarados and Dustox, it's time to shine. Slacking comes in and I immediately switch into Gyarados to get in an Intimidate and tank a facade. With slacking now unable to move for a turn, I can cleanly switch in Dustox. And now we use our combo. First Protect, then Poison Sting, then Protect then Poison Sting, etc. Eventually, Slacking gets poisoned, and now we play the waiting game. In the meantime, I can switch to using Confusion now instead of Poison Sting to deal damage for the rest of the fight, while I continue to use Protect during turns that Slacking can actually attack me. We end up having to use all of our Protect PP basically, but it eventually got the job done. If I ended up running out of Protects and Dustox went down, Slacking would have been at a low enough HP that Berloom should have easily been able to come in and clean up the fight with Mach Punch. Norman finally goes down, earning us our 5th gym badge and the TMs for Facade. We're going to start with picking up a few items while we're around this area of the map. We've taught Surf to our water types, and so we'll start with a couple of pickups in Petalburg. By surfing across the two ponds in town, we can pick up an Ether, a Hidden Rare Candy, and a Max Revive, which is nice for some extra cash. I'm personally saving all of my rare candies until I get later in the game, where the grinding becomes a lot more tedious. Next, I'm going to stop by the Pokemon Center to take a few Pokemon out of the box that we'll need for the Winona fight, Numel and Electrike. While Camerup is not very useful at all for most of the game, he's actually quite nice to have on Winona. And Manectric, along with any other Electric type really, starts to get a lot better as we enter the second half of the game. We'll definitely want to head back west so we can check out the water routes that go from Petalburg all the way to Slayport. There's one item in particular that we really need for Winona that's located inside the abandoned ship on Route 108. More on that in a little bit, but before we do that, Let's take a quick detour to the east, back to our hometown of Little Root. Mom has an awesome gift for us for beating up on Dad, the amulet coin. Extra money in most Pokemon games is not usually all that helpful, but in the Generation 3 games, it's a big deal. Having access to money in Emerald means having access to the most powerful TMs in the game in Flamethrower, Thunderbolt, and Ice Beam, all of which can be purchased from the game corner in Mauville for essentially 80,000 Poké Dollars each. That will help a lot. Now it's time to leave the Petalburg area and head out on the nearest water routes. There are some more items to pick up along the way back to Slateport, trainers to grind on, and an abandoned ship to explore. After navigating through the trainers on routes 105 and 107, 
We finally arrive on Route 108, where the abandoned ship awaits. More trainers to grind on for some more experience and cash, but there's also a very important item we need to pick up here. Now that I'm actually starting to pay attention to the game a bit more, why the hell are people on this thing to begin with? Wouldn't that be illegal? Actually, forget that. If this ship is abandoned, how is it not capsized yet? Shouldn't it be at the bottom of the route? Forget it. I, I should honestly know better than to question logic in Pokemon games, but I'll probably end up, still end up doing it anyway. Once we navigate through the abandoned ship to acquire the storage, key, we head over to the room, it unlocks, and pick up our free TM for Ice Beam. Absolutely busted move, especially for the next gym leader's ace. Before we continue to Route 109 and our return to Slateport City, I actually have to head back to Duford for a quick second because I completely forgot that we are able to pick up the TM for Sludge Bomb now that we've defeated Norman. Please don't skip this like I almost did. Sludge Bomb is insanely powerful in this generation considering it's a physical move instead of a special move. Super good pickup and what the hell is Small Bath? I never really paid much attention to this place, but I guess it's where all the trends are created in Hoenn. I bet no matter what the trend is, listening to these people talk is probably really funny either way. By the way, I gave Ice Beam to Gyarados for the time being. I plan on saving up money to get another for Azumarill as well. After navigating through the rest of the water routes, we head all the way back up north to Mauville City, where we pick up a little side quest for Watson. This is totally optional and very easy to accidentally overlook. You do not want to pass up on this one. He sends you over to the new Mauville area to turn off a generator running an extremely sketchy underground sector of this city. This one always kind of creeped me out a little bit. Just what the hell were you guys trying to do down there? Anyway, New Mauville is a really awesome area that you do not want to pass up. Your encounter there has a 50% chance of being S tier. You get a free Thunderbolt TM for finishing Watson's task. And if you're playing on handheld and need to know what the best grinding locations are, well, this is actually going to be it for a while. You can get back to New Mauville by heading back south to Route 110 and surfing over to the small island in the middle of the lake that sits below Cycling Road. And now we get our next encounter and we've got a 50-50 shot so let's see what we get. And unfortunately that's not the S tier Pokemon we were looking for. Oh well. Voltorb is actually not completely useless though, even if he doesn't hit really hard at, at all whatsoever. Fast electric types in general are just really really good in Pokemon Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald. So many good matchups, great defensively, just gotta be aware of Earthquakes. However, this could have been a Magnemite, and that kinda sucks. Outside of the Mudkip line, Magneton just may be the second or third best Pokemon in this entire game for any Nuzlocke. If you get one from here, protect it with your life, because it can carry your run all the way through as long as you're careful. Both Pokemon are pretty useful right now anyways, as both can be nice to have on Winona. You'll notice that I ended up screwing around with this Voltorb a lot before I got it, because it kept screeching and I couldn't remember if this thing could potentially have self-destruct at this level, so I played it very safe before actually catching it. After turning off this sketchy ass generator, I pop an escape rope and head back to Watson to pick up my reward, Thunderbolt, which will be immediately taught to our Electrike, soon to be Manectric. With the bonus routes out of the way, it's time to finally start heading east and make our way over to Fortree City. As soon as you cross over into Route 118, you'll want to talk to the fishermen on the beach right away to pick up your next fishing rod and get our next encounter with it, Carvana. This is basically a guaranteed encounter every single run, and it's a decent one on Honestly. Charpedo is super fast and hits super hard, and has a great typing as well. He can be a little tricky to use because of how frail he is, but he's great on Tate and Liza, and if you need something to sweep Phoebe with later in the game, Sharpedo is perfect for that. Route 119 is fairly uneventful for the most part, really. You clear out the Weather Institute, get your free cast form, and then you do face your rival. Although, this is one of the easier rival battles, honestly. It doesn't really feel like they've improved their team at all since the last time you faced them. As long as you're aware of what their starter is capable of, you really shouldn't have much of an issue on this one. And just like that, we're in Fortree City. Of course, we won't really be spending much time here, as we have to go through a little bit of Route 120 before Winona can actually open up. This is also a really good time to mention that you do not have to take on this gym right away, and in fact, you can delay it for quite a long time. There are a ton of accessible routes past Fortree City that you can navigate through before facing Winona, and that also means a ton of new encounters that go with it. You can access routes 120 through 124, Mount Pyre, the Safari Zone, 
and Lily Cove City all before setting foot in the 6th gym. If you don't believe you have the encounters to take on Winona currently, definitely take the time to pick up all of those other encounters. A big word of caution though while you do this. Route 120 is one of the tougher routes in the whole game. And honestly, avoiding trainers where you can might be the way to go, even if you do need the experience. At the very least, make sure you just don't engage in any double battles if you can. What's particularly scary about this route is actually the constant rain. There's a trainer on here, I believe his name is Cool Trainer Lionel, that has a Manectric with a 100% accuracy thunder. And I think there's another trainer on this route with a Melodic as well, depending on what game you're playing. Lots of scary stuff here. Be very, very careful going through here. Now on Route 121, and there's not much to see here. Although, I'm starting to reach the current level cap of 33 with a few of my Pokemon. So I'll need to make my preparations for Winona soon and head back over to take her on. While I'm here, I pick up my next encounter, which ends up being a... oh, okay. Kecleon it is then. I think that's a crazy rare encounter. Unfortunately, not a great pickup. I like the idea behind his design, but in practice, it just hurts him more than it helps. He'll chill in the box probably for the rest of the run, unless I can think of some weird and creative idea to use him somehow. Finally in Lily Cove, and I think we can all take a deep breath for a second. Those routes are long and can really wear you down. This part of the game is quite boring, honestly, and it can get quite tedious. There really isn't much to do here, but I like stopping by the Pokemon Center at least so I can just fly down here after getting the badge from Winona. If you're feeling up for it, Feel free to take on your rival outside of the department store as well. This place does sell some pretty good TMs if you're looking for a boost, even against Winona. You also now have access to the move deleter, which is really nice at this point as well to remove any of those unwanted HMs that you may have had to use on some of your main team members earlier on in the game. But for the most part, as soon as we walk into Lily Cove, we are pretty much walking right back out. I'm actually not going to stop by Mount Pyre and the other routes around that area at this point, because I think I'm almost ready to take on Winona for the most part. I just have to grind up a few more Pokemon to the level cap first, which shouldn't take too much longer. It is also at this point that I'm going to take some time to travel all the way back to Mauville City. Yes, I know that's basically the other side of the map. So I can use that hard earned money I made with the help of the amulet coin to purchase another TM for Ice Beam and teach it to Azumarill. This way I have a backup answer to Winona's Altaria if my Gyarados isn't able to take her down by himself. This game corner is absolutely insane and you should totally abuse it if you're able to. I actually had enough to buy two of them, so I did. I'm going to need the second one for a Pokemon we'll be getting much later on in the game. More on that later. From here, I just need to do a little bit more grinding so I can get my Numble to level 33, so he evolves into Camerupt, at which point he'll also learn Rock Slide, which is great. Like I mentioned earlier, New Mauville is going to be the best place to grind at this point in the game if your strategy is grinding on wild Pokemon. I will say that leveling through the daycare is going to start to become far more efficient at this point in the game, and pretty much for the rest of the game for that matter. I'll list my grinding guide in the description below for reference. Check that out if you need some tips. After some more grinding, Numble finally evolves into Camerupt, and we're just about ready to head back to Fortree. Starting off this episode right, with a boss fight. Let's quickly go over the team before we get into it. I'm leading this fight off with the newest member of our team, Camerupt. As I went over in the last episode, Camerupt overall does not perform very well in the Generation 3 games, with one major exception, and that's Winona. It's very good against three of her five team members, especially that Skarmory, which is always an annoying one to deal with. It's also nice having a Pokemon that I know I won't be using for the rest of the playthrough for this fight, because Camerupt can take the risks that my other Pokemon don't have to take. Next up is my Manectric, who will deal with Winona's Pelipper very handily. She'll also be backing up Camerupt against that Skarmory in case something goes wrong. I'm having Manectric hold a Person Berry as well, just in case Pelipper goes for Supersonic when I switch in. Next, Gyarados, who I have enlisted to take out Winona's notorious ace, Altaria. Gyarados is a perfect counter, with the 4 times effective Ice Beam at his disposal, and the flying type avoiding all of those nasty earthquakes. Finally, I have Azumarill, who I kept on the team so she could back up Gyarados just in case something goes wrong against Altaria. Both Gyarados and Azumarill are holding Citrus Berries to give them some extra health on top of their decently defensive bulk already. 
Breloom and Grovile are spectators for the most part, but Breloom could theoretically save me if things were to go horribly wrong. As long as he moves first, of course. And that's it. I'm ready. Let's do this. I open up with Camerupt and swiftly take out her weakest Pokemon in Swablu with a Rock Slide. She decides to go with Pelipper next, and so I switch into Manectric to take it out. She goes for a Protect three times in a row though, which I found odd, but hey, I'm not complaining. Thunderbolt eventually gets through, and Pelipper goes down. Her ace, Altaria, comes out next, and so Gyarados is up. She goes for a Dragon Dance right away, which I think is pretty much what this Altaria always does on the first turn in my experience. But with the attack drop we get with Intimidate, and Altaria's poor base attacking stats, even after two Dragon Dances, Aerial Ace just doesn't do too much to us. And after two Ice Beams, the worst part of this fight goes down with ease. Tropius comes out next, and since Tropius is just really bad overall, I just decided to keep Gyarados in to finish him off with several Ice Beams. Winona ends up wasting all of our Hyper Potions here, which is super nice. Skarmory finally comes out, and I don't know what I was really doing here. I thought Camerupt would be fine, but a crit from Aerial Ace puts me too low to do anything. I ended up switching back into Gyarados to get an attack drop in, and Skarmory's Aerial Aces are just tickling Gyarados at this point. I let Gyarados stay in for the fight, knowing that a crit from Aerial Ace wasn't even enough to put me in any real danger. Several surfs later, and Winona finally goes down, earning us the 6th Gym Badge and the TM for Aerial Ace, which is very nice. And that was clean as hell, and went exactly as planned. It's a beautiful thing. Gyarados really carry us hard there. Now that we're done with Winona, we begin an even longer trek towards the 7th gym. Seriously, this section of the game is a serious slog, and the next level cap gets raised all the way up to level 42, which means we've got a lot of grinding to do. There will be plenty of routes and trainers, but it's still not enough to actually push us that high. And so it's at this point in the game that I highly recommend using the daycare grinding methods in order to level your Pokemon up. It'll be much, much faster than grinding out wild Pokemon, trust me. I'm swapping out Camerupt here for just the flyer for the convenience. I will have to evolve him first, of course. I don't have any plans to level up anybody else at this moment in time, as my current team is already decently equipped to deal with Tate and Liza as is, I think. We'll see as we get closer, though. I actually ran down Route 120 and 121 again, so that I could take out some of the trainers I had skipped over originally. And then, I made my way towards Route 122 and 123 to take out a few more, and pick up some items along the way. Route 123 has some very nice things to collect, including the TM for Giga Drain, some Citrus Berries, PP Ups, and a Rare Candy as well. And after all that, my Golbat finally evolves into Crobat, and I can finally teach him Fly now, which will be very helpful. Route 123 is also where I'll get my next encounter, and it's a Shuppet. It's not bad. Banette is okay overall. It's not a Pokemon that you would pick for your A-team, but if you've lost some party members along the way, he's not a bad option by any means. Ghost types in general are always useful to some extent in any Nuzlocke, due to the immunities to normal and fighting. They make for excellent pivots in quite a few situations. Stats are also decent, and the coverage is very nice. I don't know if we'll use them, but it's a nice tool to have in our tool belt if we need it. On to Mount Pyre to push the story forward. But not before we clear out all of these trainers, pick up the TM for Shadow Ball along with a few other items along the way. Be very careful with these trainers in this place though. There are a few that have lob effects, so be prepared for those. I would highly recommend leading with a party member that can apply Poison, Burn, or Leech Seed or something like that to safely take them down. They come with the Shadow Tag ability, so you can't switch out or escape in any way, which is super scary. We run into our next encounter as well, which will be Duskull, which is guaranteed. A very nice encounter for sure. Dusclops is like Banette, just better. 
Defensively bulky, a very nice toxic user, gets Confuse Ray, good addition to the team, can be pretty much used anywhere in the game. And after climbing all the way up here, Archie runs away, an old man tries to tell me a story, and I swiftly leave to continue my quest. Off to the Jagged Pass to deal with Maxi and Team Magma. At the Magma hideout, I can actually get another encounter here in Geodude. Unfortunately, it's not a great pickup for this stage of the game. The Geodude line is actually quite nice if you can grab him back in Granite Cave, as he can be great against Watson, Flannery, and Winona. But since we're past Winona at this point, he falls off a cliff basically, as most of the content at this point is just gonna wreck him. After plowing through the red trash that are Magma Grunts and Tabitha, we finally reach Maxi. This is a boss fight you should do a little bit of prep for, but it's not that bad. His camera up is powerful if it does get an attack off, but it's super slow, and if you have a decent water type on you, he should go down in one hit. His Mighty Anna's Swagger and his Crobat's Confuse Ray are both very annoying and could potentially get you into some trouble. I had some problems myself as you can see from the health of some of my Pokemon. But in the end, Maxi finally goes down and just fucks off. <laughs> and now it's time for us to head over to Slateport to deal with the other morons. After very quickly dealing with Team Aqua, I can finally head over to Lily Cove, where another rival fight awaits us in front of the Lily Cove department store. Much like the previous rival fight, this one isn't all that scary. He's actually got some really good Pokemon, but what in the hell happened to their movesets? It's like Brendan intentionally nerfed his own team by removing Double Kick from his Combustion, having Nature Power on his Ludicolo, like, I, I don't understand. It's just a little bizarre to me. Tropius is just not a good Pokemon and goes down to a whole bunch of stuff, and Pelipper may honestly be his best Pokemon and perhaps the only one that will really cause you any potential problems. I'm not saying to go completely blind on this fight, but you'll probably be just fine with minimum strategy. Don't forget to pick up the TM for rest in this house here. Very useful to have in any Nuzlocke. Self-healing is just great. On to the Team Aqua Hideout. There's really nothing to see here or explain, just make sure you don't forget to pick up the Master Ball while you're in here. Otherwise, just clear out the blue trash and mat to get this story moving along. And now we have all the water routes to push through. I'm going to spend some time to run through a bunch of trainers to get as much experience as I can before heading to Moss Deep City. The level cap of 42 is just not going to be obtainable though without doing some grinding at the daycare, which I'll take care of as well. But yeah, Tate and Liza is the next step, and we're a bit far from that. I wasn't kidding when I said this would be the biggest slog in the game by far. Not a whole lot of items to pick up on either of these routes either, but you can pick up the King's Rock, Sunstone, and Super Rod while you're in Moss Deep, which are definitely nice. But for now, I've got my grinding hat on, and I'll see you in a bit. And I'm back, with a full team of six, pretty much ready to go. I decided ultimately not to switch out any of my members and leveled up my Crobat alongside everybody else. While he won't be super helpful in this gym, I think having him around for the future will be a good idea. I'm thinking I'll only really need Sceptile, Gyarados, and Azure Arrow mostly for this fight, with Manectric being peppered in there to deal with Zatu perhaps. At least, the grind is finally done, and we can move on to Titan Lazar. So, if you remember what happened at the end of the last episode, I basically finalized my team and began preparing for the Tate and Liza fight. You also may notice that I have swapped out Berloom for a Sharpedo instead. The decision to level up and evolve my Carvana instead was a direct result of those preparations that I was making. The more and more I thought about it, I started to realize that I was just taking too many risks with the way my team was currently constructed, relying very heavily on Sceptile and Gyarados to do most of the damage. Sharpedo will make this fight much, much safer to navigate both offensively and defensively with his dark typing. However, what is not cool about this Sharpedo is that it has a careful nature, which lowers special attack, and that is actually enough to make this fight a lot more scary for me. So here you'll notice that I've actually committed some of my hard-earned money on Calcium to boost his special attack EVs. I've also had him hold a Macho Brace and spent a lot of time EV training that same stat as well. It was quite the grind, but it's going to make this fight a whole lot easier for us. With the team now officially finalized, let's see what we got in store for the Psychic Twins. Our starter can now finally begin to have a huge impact in boss fights. 
Sceptile is leading the charge for this fight, and will be hitting the Leaf Blade button over and over again. He's holding a person berry for this fight in case Zatu decides to use Confuse Ray, which would make things much more complicated if he were to pull that off. Running alongside Sceptile for the upcoming double battle is our newest team member in Sharpedo. I highly recommend bringing at least one Dark type to this fight due to the immunity the typing gets against psychic moves, and Sharpedo is a great pick. I'll be using either Surf or Crunch depending on how the battle plays out, but either case is going to be very strong against all of their Pokemon. Sharpedo is also holding a Person Berry to again avoid being confused by Zatu, who literally cannot do anything else to this Sharpedo because its only damaging move is Psychic. Electric is up next and he'll be used to finish off Zatu most likely with a speedy Thunderbolt. That's really it for the most part, she'll be holding a Citrus Berry just for some extra healing, along with the other three remaining team members as well. Gyarados is Gyarados. <laughs> It's nice and bulky and will be spamming Surf if I need him. I'll probably switch him in regardless just to be on the safe side. He's just got so much bulk compared to the rest of my team. It will be difficult to take him down. Azumarill is a backup to the backup essentially. Hoping my situation won't become dire enough to use her, but it's just good to have insurance like this for your boss fights. And if Azumarill is insurance, then Crobat is hyper insurance. This one's got Shadow Ball and is of course really really fast. So if I absolutely need to use it for some reason, the option is there. This team looks great to me, but I was not expecting this battle to go the way that it did. I'm not even going to say anything actually. I'm just gonna go AFK for a couple minutes while you guys watch how this went. I am baffled on how easy this went. This fight went easier than Roxanne or literally any other boss fight that we've had up to this point. We were not touched once. Zatu used Confuse Ray on both of my Pokemon for some reason, which essentially did nothing. And then the other three all went down with a Leaf Blade Surf combo. Truly ridiculous. On the way out of the gym, I head back to the Pokemon Center to take Berloom back out of the box, as well as a new team member, Lombre. I'll now be able to acquire the Water Stone in order to evolve him into Ludicolo, who will be very, very helpful for the remainder of the run. He's bulky, gets a great moveset, and has a fantastic typing against the remaining boss fights. Moving on to some more story stuff, I quickly head over to the Space Center to deal with Mr. Maxi and Team Magma again. The double battle alongside Steven was not that interesting. Maxi and Tabitha are generally very easy to take out with the team that we've assembled. Afterwards, we head over to Steven's house where he gives us the HM for Dive, and I teach it to Gyarados so we can continue to press progress through the game. 
Gyarados has kinda become an HM mule for the time being, but that should change later on. Before we try and continue the story, we've got some stuff to do. First, I'm heading over to Shoal Cave to the north of Moss Deep City to pick up a very important guaranteed encounter in Sphiel. If you've watched my other videos in the past, you'll know that I have an extreme fondness of Walrein. Walrein is an S tier Pokemon in these games in my opinion. He's bulky, hits pretty hard, has a solid ability, and more importantly, has great boss fight matchups for the rest of the game. Walrein can practically solo the Elite Four if you let him. More specifically, he basically trivializes Drake and his dragon types. I just love this Pokemon and I never get tired of using him. He'll chill in the box for a little bit though as I don't think we'll really need him for the 8th gym. On to the next task. Now that I have the HM for dive, I'm going to head back to the abandoned ship so I can pick up that water stone to evolve Lombre into Ludicolo. While you're here, feel free to pick up the TM for Rain Dance and the skin as well if you want them. After leaving the abandoned ship, I don't waste any time and immediately evolve Lombre into Ludicolo. I already have Fake Out, and otherwise all the other moves I plan on using with Ludicolo are going to be from TMs anyway. Back over to Moss Deep City, I now head south to routes 127 and 128 to fight whatever trainers I can for some more experience, and pick up the various items along the way. There are a bunch of heart scales if you need them, some vitamins, and a rare candy I believe on one of the nearby islands that require dive to get to. Otherwise, there's not much else to do after some grinding, other than to head over to the seafloor cavern to deal with Team Aqua and their plans. After arriving, take out some grunts, go through some easy puzzles, and do not leave this place without picking up the TM for Earthquake. Other than that, pretty standard stuff. And now, one of the few times you actually face off against Archie, and he's fairly underwhelming for the most part. By this point in the game, your Pokemon are just so much stronger, and dealing with the evil teams is just not as dangerous as it was earlier in the playthrough. You do fight Maxi a lot more in Emerald, which I always thought was a little weird. Oh well, time to awaken Kyogre and take out Archie and catapult ourselves into the climax of the story. I always liked this scene with Archie and Maxi realizing how much they completely fucked everything up. It really made them feel much more relatable. The scene in general just felt impactful from the dialogue to the constant rain and especially the music. And yes, how can you not stop and bask in the nostalgia that are these cutscenes? I won't bore you too much more with the story related stuff. We follow Steven to the cave of origin, speak to Wallace about the conflict, and then head over to Sky Pillar to let Big Daddy Ray Ray know that it's too Two little brats are at it again. Now is also a good time to mention that the Sky Pillar is also a very nice grinding location for this section of the game. If you don't plan on using the daycare or the Gabby and Ty methods to train up your party that is. The wild Pokemon here are high level and will yield a pretty good amount of experience. Before I am able to face Juan, I have some grinding to do, and some preparations to make for my strategy. While I work through the grind, I've gotten a few comments throughout a few of my videos asking about damage calculations and how I perform them. So allow me to give you a little quick rundown of how I do this for my boss fight prep, and just what my overall thought process is. I won't go over every little detail that I've done to prepare for Juan, but this is essentially how I go about strategizing personally for any boss fight. First, I'll look at the enemy's team and compare them to some of the main Pokemon I plan on using. I use damage calculations very, very loosely. I don't bother going through every single scenario on every single Pokemon in the fight. The goal is to quickly gain a rough understanding of how hard my Pokemon can hit and how hard the enemy's Pokemon can hit, and that's it. So, I take a quick look at Juan's team and I see the Pokemon, I see the typings, movesets, abilities, and items. Now, I'm already super familiar with most of this information myself, so this step for me is usually fairly quick. I already know what types Whiskash is weak to, for example. I already know what Double Team and Rest do on his Kingdra, I already know what a Chesto Berry does, and I already have a general understanding of what the stat distribution looks like on each of these Pokemon. I don't have exact numbers, but I have a rough idea. If you don't have this knowledge though, opening these links up in a new tab and getting a quick understanding of these aspects is a good idea if you have the time. Now I look at what I've got, and the first one I'm looking at is of course my Sceptile. Since I know with 100% certainty that I'm going to lean on Sceptile heavily in this fight, I'll use him as an example for my damage calculation examples. Pokemon Showdown's damage calculator is absolutely ridiculous, and I'll leave a link for that in the description. Quick point of order though before I begin, do not let this screen stress you out. There is a whole lot of fucking shit here you can basically calculate how an entire battle will go. 
right down to the absolute smallest of details. But you don't need all of this. In fact, you only need a small fraction of this amazing tool in order to grab some very, very valuable information out of it. First things first, let's add our Pokemon on the left side and the first enemy Pokemon on the right side, along with their levels. When you do this, you'll see a bunch of preset options that appear for each Pokemon that you select from the dropdown. You can ignore all of these and simply select blank set. So now that we have our matchup, it's time to add some moves to each one to see what each side is capable of damaging. And now we can see our results. So in this top pane here, you'll get these percentages listed next to each move on both sides. This is roughly the percentage of health that the move would deal in damage. In this example, Sceptile's Leaf Blade will take out 150 to 177 percent of Love Disc's HP, which means it will always kill in one hit. Meanwhile, Love Disc's Water Pulse will not deal more than 7 percent of my HP, which is good to know. Some extra notes on the damage calculator. You can check speed stats to see who goes first. That is often very valuable to know. Only apply natures if the percentage value is very very close to killing either your Pokemon or the enemy. Otherwise, don't worry too much about the natures. You can click this crit button next to each move to see how much damage that would do, which is also very helpful. Some moves may require some extra adjustments, like Flail's damage for example, is increased when a Pokemon's HP is lower. So you can just go over here and adjust the current HP value to whatever you are currently seeing in your battle. There is a whole lot here that you can play around with if you want to, but if you don't, that's okay too. Just stick to adding the Pokemon, the moves, and taking a look at the results. The numbers won't be exact, but the amount of value you get from this tool just to get a rough idea is really, really great. And again, I do not do this for every single Pokemon necessarily. It's usually just the ones I'm worried about personally. But like I said, if you've got the time and it helps you to do that, then go for it. After doing some of these general damage calculations on the Pokemon I want to look into, I then have to start thinking about how to construct my team, plus the order in which one's Pokemon will come out, etc. The case where I lead with Sceptile, I can most likely expect either Juan's Celio or Kingdra due to their ice coverage. If you were on the damage calculations on Celio, Leaf Blade does not kill unfortunately, only dealing roughly 90% of Celio's health in damage. But, and this is where more and more experience with the game mechanics allows you to think outside the box a little bit, if I intentionally bring Sceptile to the fight with less than 30% of his HP, his overgrow ability goes into effect, and in that case, Leaf Blade is a guaranteed one hit KO on Celio. Is that the plan I'm going to go with? Maybe, but not necessarily. Because what if his Kingdra comes out next? Or what if I want the extra HP on Sceptile for later so I can switch him into Whiskash at some point or even Crawdon? These are all questions that pop into my head when I'm making preparations. Maybe I should just make an unscripted video where I talk through my entire process step by step and maybe that would make things even clearer. Or more complicated, I don't know. Let me know what you guys think. I think I'll make a separate video on damage calculations at the very least anyway at some point in the future, but I hope this quick tutorial was helpful. With all of that being said, let me wrap up this grind and finish the rest of my preparations and then we can go over the team. And here we are, full team of six at the level cap. Three grass types and an electric type will definitely help us, with every Pokemon on this roster except for Crobat having a resistance to water. Starting with Berloom, I decided to go with the high risk high reward approach to start the fight off. See, the biggest issue I'll have with Juan is his Kingdra, as it typically sets up with double team before sweeping your entire team with water pulse and ice beam. Luckily for me, as I just mentioned, I have a bunch of Pokemon on this squad that can resist water and ice fairly well. So with Berloom, my goal is to try to one shot the Love Disk, then one shot the Celio if that happens to be what comes out next, and then attempt to leech seed his Kingdra who will inevitably come out at the, after that point, since it will want to ice beam my Berloom into Oblivion. Kingdra could theoretically come out sooner and that's fine, it doesn't really change the overall strategy. What makes this risky is that I have to use Sky Uppercut in order to one shot both Love Disk and Celio, and this move is only 90% accurate. And speaking of 90% accurate, that goes for Leech Seed as well. So a lot could go wrong here. Luckily, if this plan does completely fail, I have a lot of other ways to get back into the fight safely. We'll see how things unfold, but if I could get Leech Seed off on Kingdra, it would be game over for Juan. 
Next up is Ludicolo, who is bulky as all hell and comes with that incredible water grass typing. If things go wrong with my Breloom, Ludicolo would become a huge part of the backup strategy. I gave it a few PP ups to get that Giga Drain usage up, and it should be able to stall Kingdra out pretty well. If I have to resort to that, draining Kingdra's Ice Beam PP will be the way to go, as if Kingdra runs out of Ice Beams, it will be very difficult for it to take out anything on my team with just Water Pulse. It's also worth mentioning that Ludicolo is also holding a Lepa Berry for even more Giga Drains if I need them. Which I might, considering I could have to use a bunch of them to get through those double teams that Kingdra might use. Every other team member is using a Citrus Berry for extra healing. I'm so glad that Sceptile is finally here and worth using. Sceptile can stand toe to toe with every single one of Juan's Pokemon other than Kingdra with Ice Beam. But if I can stall out that Ice Beam, then all of a sudden Sceptile has a much more favorable matchup. Especially since I also gave him Aerial Ace, so he'll never miss even with all those double teams being up. He'll be used to take out Whiskash for sure as he resists all of his attacks, and perhaps even Crawdon as well. Manectric is up next and I brought him because he's an electric type and this is a water chip. Not really much else to say. Although it is really good to know that he is theoretically capable of two-shotting Kingdra with Thunders if I have to go for a Hail Mary play. I probably won't use Thunder Wave because Kingdra can just use Rest to remove it. Gyarados will definitely be used if I need the backup plan to help stall out Kingdra's Ice Beam PP. I'll try to get in an Earthquake here and there as well if that makes sense. Finally, we have Crobat, who is the backup to the backups. Confuse Ray is useful and so is Shadow Ball if I can get the special defense drop to help the others out. I think that's everything. Just one more badge left. Let's do this. I lead with Breloom and of course immediately implement my primary strategy. One ninety percent roll down, two to go. Cilio ends up coming out next and another Sky Uppercut hits. So far so good. Now for his ace, Kingdra. He goes for the double team first. But it doesn't matter. Leech Seed hits regardless and we are in incredible shape right now. Wow, I am so glad that ended up working out. With Ludicolo now in, we begin stalling until a combination of Leech Seed and direct attacks can bring Kingdra down. This process took an extremely long time. I basically went through all of Ludicolo's Ice Beam PP twice, all of his Giga Drain PP, all of Kingdra's Rest PP, and most of his Ice Beam as, as well. I actually had to switch Ludicolo out for a combination of my other Pokemon because I ran out of moves to use outside of Surf. But eventually, Kingdra finally gets taken out by Manectric, and the worst of it is now over. The remaining Pokemon are just cleanup duty for Sceptile. After a pointless rain dance from Whiskash and a couple of Leaf Blades later, Juan is finished, as well as our gym challenge. With the 8th badge in our hands, we're quickly approaching the end of the game, and I can't wait to take on the Pokemon League with this squad. Now that the 8th badge is ours, we now have access to use the HM for Waterfall outside of battle. So first things first, I'm going to go ahead and pick up a few items around the map. Not that I need Waterfall for this one, but I did somehow forget up to pick the TM for Brick Break while I've been in Sutopolis. Such a great move for this generation. 
Next up is Route 119, where you can grab a rare candy and a nugget as well. You will need the acro bike to get these though, so if you're too lazy to go back to Mallville and swap bikes, then don't worry about it. On Route 114, you can scale the waterfall now to grab yet another rare candy. And now, in Meteor Falls, we can pick up two awesome TMs in Iron Tail and Dragon Claw. Dragon Claw is very, very nice to have, especially for Drake if we need it. Also, feel free to take on all of the new trainers in this area in the cave as well for some extra experience. With those quick items out of the way, it's time to head over to Victory Road and take on our last remaining steps before the Pokemon League. First up is the new encounter, Hariyama. Hariyama is great, honestly. Fighting types are hard to come by in this region and he's a good one. It can come with either Guts or Thick Fat, which are both very useful, and he even gets Belly Drum for some crazy setup potential. It is harder to pull that off compared to Linoon because he is so slow, but still. I'll have to decide if he's worth adding to the endgame team. Our last big challenge before the Pokemon League is upon us. Wally. Alright buddy, let's see what you got. I lead with Gyarados to attempt to bring Altaria down with Ice Beams. I like Gyarados here first instead of Ludicolo because Wally will want to bring out his Magneton next, whom Gyarados can potentially dispose of. After some back and forth, Altaria goes down and out comes that Magneton. Now, I know I am faster, and I'm pretty confident that Gyarados can one-shot this Magneton with an Earthquake. Luckily, I was correct in my calculation there, and Magneton goes down without any issues. If he didn't go down and got a Thunderbolt off, Gyarados surely would have been gone. Delcaddy comes out next, and I just decide to stick with Gyarados at this point. I mean... Come on, it's a Delcaddy. Although, I didn't expect to one-shot it with a crit earthquake. That's always nice, I guess. Wally's ace Gardevoir comes out, and it's definitely the most dangerous Pokemon he has. Luckily for us though, we have a dark type in Sharpedo. Not only that, but a dark type with Taunt, which I forgot to use on the first turn, but then remembered it existed and it's a great move for this situation. After several crunches, Gardevoir finally goes down and now it's just Rosalia to deal with. I switch back into Sceptile to take the Giga Drain and the Future Sight. The Future Sight definitely dealt way more damage than I thought it would, so I have to switch out again, this time into Gyarados. I get toxic but with one single Earthquake, Wally's final Pokemon is finally disposed of. Very smooth fight for the most part, but we've got some pretty incredible Pokemon to play around with at this point, so I guess that's to be expected. The rest of Victory Road is pretty uneventful, and annoying of course due to the rooms being dark and I'm too lazy to teach a Pokemon Flash. Don't forget to pick up the TM for Psychic while you're here if you want it, but to be honest though, it's not all that useful unless you're running with an Alakazam or a Gardevoir, or perhaps a Girafferig or something like that. Nothing in the Pokemon League is weak to it, so it's not as helpful in this game as it usually is in others. But just like that, we've finally made it all the way to the League as this series is getting very close to the end. Unless I fuck up really really bad. <laughs> it is also at this point that I'll be looking to design the team and deal with the ridiculous amount of grinding to get everyone leveled up and ready to go. For me, that'll take some time, but luckily for you guys, it'll only take a few seconds. See you in a bit for the team review. After a lot of grinding later, I am finally ready to talk about the team, as well as the Pokemon League in general. Let's actually start with how I feel about this game's Pokemon League, and how good each member is. Sydney is leading the way as Hoenn's first League opponent. Generally speaking, the first boss fight in any Pokemon League is generally fairly weak, or perhaps the better term is manageable. Sydney is no different here, and honestly, he's probably one of the weaker members of any Elite Four squad in my opinion. There are actually quite a few gym leaders in Emerald that I would personally identify as being much more difficult to get through compared to Sydney. His team overall includes some fairly weak Pokemon just in general. Funnily enough, in Emerald his team actually gets worse because he replaces his Sharpedo with a Crawdon, which is definitely a downgrade. Mightyena has Intimidate, but outside of Sand Attack is just more of an annoyance than a threat. Cacturn and Crawdon are both underperforming Pokemon in general, Shift Tree's moveset is weird, and Absol, of course, is utterly punished by the physical special split. Out of everything here, Absol is literally the only Pokemon you need to have some sort of a plan for, and that plan is quite simple, kill it before it sets up with Sword Stance. Overall, when you design a team for Hoenn's Pokemon League, I find it best to just move backwards and strategize for the Champion and Drake fights first before anything else. 
You can save your strategizing for Sydney and Phoebe until you figured out how you're going to get through those remaining fights first. Speaking of Phoebe, she's up next, and while a little more challenging than Sydney, she's still fairly underwhelming. Her team is very defensive, sporting a couple of Dusclops and a Sableye, but none of those Pokemon mentioned have movesets that reflect this playstyle very well. That especially goes for her Ace, which is the higher level Dusclops, who is running with a full offensive moveset. Phoebe feels underwhelming because while her Pokemon are tanky, they don't hit you for very much at all for the most part. It's a similar trend with her remaining Bonnets as well. Bonnet can actually hit pretty hard physically, and yet one of her Bonnets is using Psychic and Thunderbolt, and the other is using Feint Attack, which are all special moves. Talking back to the point that her Dusclops and Sableye aren't set up very well as tanks, why does her first Bonnet have a Will-O-Wisps instead of Dusclops having something similar, like Toxic? I'm not saying that this fight is free, but there are a lot of ways you can go about fighting her. And again, similar to Sydney, don't even think about Phoebe until you've designed a plan for Glacia, Drake, and Wallace slash Steven if you're playing Ruby or Sapphire. You can take her down with pretty much anything. Next up in Hoenn's Elite Four is Glacia, and this is where the difficulty starts to really spike. Every one of her Pokemon, apart from her first Celio, the one that she leads with, should be taken into consideration. The second Celio has Attract and Hail, which makes the battle surprisingly annoying if she pulls both of them off. The first Glalie has Light Screen, which will greatly reduce any fire damage you plan on using, as well as any special attacks just in general. The second Glalie has fucking Explosion, which is the second most terrifying move for any Nuzlocker in any run in any game. And speaking of the most terrifying move for any Nuzlocker to experience, Glacia's ace, Walrein, has Sheer Cold, a move with only 30% accuracy but will automatically KO your opponent if it lands. And what makes that extra scary is that Walrein is extremely bulky and rarely goes down in a single hit, often not even in two hits, so it's going to stick around for a few turns in most cases. Fighting and electric types are obviously pretty good here, but anything that's bulky will also be very, very helpful. A very common strategy I see a lot is to set up on her first Pokemon, Celio, and then try to go for a sweep from there. Moving on to Drake, and his fight can be particularly strange at times. When you look at his team overall, it's really scary, and on paper, Drake is a tough fight. However, his AI does have some quirks that allow you to expose a good half of his team without putting yourself into too much danger. His Shelgon lead, for example, loves, loves, loves to use Protect. A lot. I have no idea why, but this makes him another great example to set up on and sweep the rest of the fight. Kingdra and Altaria both seem to press Dragon Dance right off the bat, no matter which Pokemon is switched in, unless they see a kill, I guess. But they often Dragon Dance way more than they need to as well sometimes, which, again, just opens the door for you to bring them down or set up your strategy. Three of Drake's five Pokemon have a quad weakness to Ice. Against most most dragon-based boss fights in the series, utilizing moves like Ice Beam is usually enough to destroy everything, even when they are only two times weak. But four times weak? As you'll also hear in my team review coming up, one single Pokemon with decent special attack and Ice Beam will completely decimate this team. And spoiler alert, Walrein is a guaranteed encounter in every single Pokemon Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald run, and he basically just makes this fight free. Nature, EVs, and IVs don't even matter. Walrein will run over this fight regardless. If you're doing a monolock or some other sort of challenge where you do not have access to a good ice beam user, then this fight all of a sudden becomes a run killer. Without ice, that Salamence is going to rain absolute hell on your head. And finally, we have the champion, Wallace, since this is Emerald. I'll try to talk about Steven in more detail in a future video. Wallace is only slightly less difficult than Steven in my mind, even though I do think Steven has a cooler team and represents the league as the champion better. But Wallace is packing probably the most insane mono water team I have ever seen in a boss fight for any game. He leads with Water Spout Wailord, who also likes using Rain Dance as well, which is it's definitely capable of doing considering its bulk. That sets up more powerful surfs and hydro pumps for the other team members. Tentacruel is fast and especially tanky, making Earthquake really the only thing that deals with this thing cleanly. Whiskash counters any plans you had involving an electric type, and otherwise is a handful for any Pokemon that doesn't have a grass move. Gyarados is Gyarados. Dragon Dance, Earthquake, Hyper Beam might doom itself, but it's taking something down with it most likely in the process. And then we have Ludicolo and Milotic. 
Now, in my experience, it is actually worth bringing two Pokemon with you that specifically deal with these two Pokemon. These two Pokemon will end your run, period. This Ludicolo is obnoxious. Leech Seed Double Team Giga Drain is so annoying, and he's so goddamn tanky already. Have a plan, whether that's giving Aerial Ace to something, or countering with a good type matchup like with Breloom, Crobat, Swallet, or other Grass slash Poison types. And finally, this Milotic. Super tanky, hits really hard, comes with Toxic and Recover. The Recover part is really what pushes this thing over the edge. You need to find a way to hit it really, really hard, or bring it down slowly with Toxic or Leech Seed, or a Burn or something like that. The problem with throwing a status on this thing though is its Marvel scale ability, which will increase Milotic's physical defense by 50%. Very tough to deal with, and you'll want to spend a lot of time with Wallace just in general, honestly. Unlike with Glacia and Drake, you can't really set up very easily, so you'll have to be more creative in your strategy. Okay, that's the general rundown of Hoenn's Pokemon League. Now let's quickly go over the team that I have assembled. Starting things off with Breloom, who will hopefully annihilate Sydney. He'll also be crucial to the Wallace fight as well, especially against that Ludicolo. Both of Ludicolo's attacking moves are not very effective against Breloom, and Breloom is also immune to Leech Seed. He's also just awesome, very cool typing, great move pull, and great stats. Next up is Walrein, who is always my MVP so long as he's a legal encounter for the current run. He's insanely tanky, hits decently hard, and learns rest via level up. You can solo many of the fights in this Pokemon League with just Walrein. He's, he's just too good. Notable uses will be switching him in as a pivot or if any of my other team members get into trouble. And of course, he will be used to crush Drake into the ground. You can just send him in, hit Ice Beam several times, and I mean, that's it for the most part. Might have to put in a little more work on Kingdra, but that's about it. Moving right along, I've already explained why Ludicolo is really good, and so it shouldn't be a surprise that I'm bringing my own. Great defensive typing, great bulk, and gets great coverage with Ice Beam and Giga Drain. I decided to go with Rest in the last slot so that Ludicolo can play a similar role to my Wall Rain as yet another backup tank that can be used as a pivot or if things get too out of control. You do have other options for that last slot though, such as Fake Outs for some extra free damage, Toxic for stalling, Rain Dance to take advantage of your ability, and even Brick Break if you want to help on Sydney or Glacia. His only weaknesses are Poison, Flying, and Bug, which are not moves that can be found anywhere in the entire Pokemon League, so he'll stick around for quite a while. My fourth team member is Gyarados. And once again, he's Gyarados. I don't know how many more times I can say it. Dragon Dance Earthquake combo with Ice Beam for some coverage. The fourth slot can be taken up by a whole lot of stuff. Protect, coverage like Flamethrower or Thunderbolt. You can use him to set up Rain Dance. There's just a lot of options here. But ultimately, he's big, bulky, and hits really hard. And he gets Intimidate. And he's got a great typing. To be honest, I've just decided to kind of ban him in most of my future Nuzlocks at this point. Unless it's a mono lock or a very special set of rules that I'm working with. He's just too powerful. Next up is Manectric, who will come in handy on Glacia and particularly against Wallace. He'll be leading the charge for Wallace and will hopefully take out a few Pokemon before he goes down. Fast electric types are just great in general and I'll have Thunder Wave as well for some extra utility if it's needed. Finally, while I did have plenty of great options for this last spot, I went with a Pokemon that I have never used in an Emerald Nuzlocke before and that's Torkoal. I could have gone with Crobat or Hariyama, and yes, even my starter is actually getting snubbed for my Pokemon League team. Torkoal is a really well designed Pokemon, honestly. The only problem is that Gen 3 is just not very kind to fire types, which is why he's maybe rated a little bit lower than some of the others in my box. But I wanted to try something different, and I'll be looking to try to use him on Glacia primarily. He could be used on Sydney as well if my Breloom somehow runs into any trouble for some reason. He will of course be useless on Wallace offensively, so he'll be ready as a strategic sacrifice if needed. And that's it. We finally made it to the end of this series, and I'm really excited to see how the League Challenge goes. Everyone is healed up and ready to go. Let's just see how much pain Berloom can inflict on Sydney and his dark types.
And as it turns out, Breloom is just a bona fide Chad and has more than enough power to completely annihilate this team with nothing but brick breaks. Keep in mind, this Breloom has not been EV trained at all in any way, so his extra stats were distributed randomly. That clearly did not matter though, as one by one, Sydney's team bows before me. Breloom is just truly ridiculous, honestly, but this also exemplifies the points I made about Sydney in the last episode. He's honestly considerably weaker than many of the other boss fights in the game, including the likes of Watson, Norman, Winona, Juan, and maybe even Flannery for that matter. He shouldn't give you too much trouble. He certainly didn't for me. <laughs> Phoebe is up next, and while I'm expecting this to be a little bit more of a challenge, she should still be fairly manageable to take out. Bring on those ghost types. I lead with Gyarados to try and go for the Dragon Dance Earthquake Sweep. This Dusclops loves leading with Protect, so the first one is always free. I go for another Dragon Dance, and Dusclops goes for a Confuse Ray. And this is where I make the very greedy mistake of going for another Dragon Dance. See, because my physical attack is so high right now, anytime I hit myself with Confusion, it's going to be a very, very bad time for me. <laughs> Not only that, but this Dusclops also could have used Curse at any time, which would essentially block my Gyarados from sweeping the whole team, as I would have had to switch him out at some point. Luckily, for some reason, I'm never punished, and I'm able to get past this first Dusclops and go on to sweep the rest of Phoebe's team with Earthquake. Three Dragon Dances was completely unnecessary, and I should have just went for Earthquakes sooner. In fact, I wouldn't have been surprised if only a single Dragon Dance could have gotten the job done, with Gyarados's already insanely high attack stat. Don't play this fight the way that I did. I could have easily been punished by this and would have been forced to play from behind. Remember, her Pokemon aren't super threatening overall, at least offensively, so just don't get greedy. Chances are, you won't need to take a whole lot of risks in order to bring her down. With the second Elite Four member down, it's time to deal with Glacia, who will definitely prove to be much more of a challenge than the first two. Let's see how I fare against that exploding Glalie and bulky Raw Wall Rain. I lead with Manectric to take her first Celio out with a quick Thunderbolt. Easy, but now things will start to get more interesting with her first Glalie. I switch out Manectric for my Torkoal and immediately start going for Amnesia to reduce the damage of all of Glalie's attacks. It just sucks that Torkoal is so goddamn slow, he's always taking so much damage. With our special defense maxed out and our already super high physical defense, it's time to start spamming Flamethrower. Clearly finally goes down as expected, Walrein comes out to start hitting us with Surfs. Looking back on this, I should have just taken Torkoal out here in favor of someone else, so I could later use him against her second Glalie and its explosion. Surf just ended up dealing way more than I thought it would for having plus 6 special defense, and on top of that, I completely forgot that the Walrein has Thick Fat, which cuts my fire damage in half. Flamethrower was not dealing anything substantial, and I ended up deciding to sacrifice my Torkoal so I wouldn't put my other team members in as much danger by allowing a clean switch. Again, I do regret this heavily. Even though I wouldn't really be using Torkoal for any other fight, really, he still probably could have been saved anyway without much of an issue. With Torkoal now gone, I switch back into Manectric to take Walrein out with one last Thunderbolt. Afterwards, Glacia decides to go for her other Celio for some reason, in instead of Glalie. I have no idea why. But another Thunderbolt from Manectric deals with it easily. 
Her final Pokemon in Glalie finally comes out, and I need to switch out to avoid a potential explosion death. I take a quick look at my team to determine who is physically the tankiest, and it turns out that it's my Gyarados, so I go with that. And I want to get some Intimidates off anyway to reduce the incoming damage from explosion if it happens to go off. I go back and forth between Gyarados and Walrein once, just so I can reduce the damage a bit further, and then I start going for Earthquakes. Luckily, it ends up being a two-hit KO, and Glalie finally goes down along with Glacia. I'm not really sure if the back and forth between Gyarados and Walrein was really necessary there. I think if I had gone through that scenario again, I would have just started attacking with Gyarados right off the bat since it was a two-hit KO. One of the biggest issues I've run into at times is simply overthinking things. Sometimes the simplest strategy is the best one, so try not to overthink it. Next up is Drake and his Dragon types, and if you remembered what I went over in the last episode, you'll know that this is going to be quick. But if you forgot, allow me to remind you. Other than maybe Sydney, Drake is a member that I'm probably the least worried about, simply because I have the absolute perfect response, Walrein. I wasn't kidding when I said you can just send out Walrein and press Ice Beam a bunch of times, even against that bulky Kingdra. One by one, Drake's dragons fall. And I'm trying to find some more to add to this fight, but really a solid Ice Beam user simply trivializes everything for the most part. And that's it. Drake is down, and now the only thing standing in our way is the champion. It all comes down to this. Even without Torkoal, I'm still feeling pretty confident, but I can't afford to make some of the mistakes I made earlier in the league, or else I'll surely be punished this time around. Just Wallace left to go. Let's do this. I lead with Manectric and quickly go for a Thunderbolt to greatly weaken the power of that Water Spout. But, Wailord decided to go for a Rain Dance instead, which is extremely baffling to me, and absolutely huge for us. This makes our Thunder 100% accurate now. Wallace naturally goes for the Full Restore, and I decided to go for a Thunderbolt instead of Thunder here, so I can try to maybe get him to waste some more of those Full Restores. But, he doesn't decide to heal Wailord up again, and a second Thunderbolt brings it down. Wallace then sends in his Gyarados, which I've seen him do very often against electric types for some reason over Whiskash. I mean, I understand that Gyarados is pretty fast, and it comes packed with Earthquake, but it's just not worth the risk, and Whiskash is perfectly capable of bringing any electric type down with its immunity. One 100% accurate Thunder crushes Gyarados into the ground, and now that Whiskash finally comes out, and the plan now is to switch into Ludicolo to take him out. Ludicolo is a fantastic matchup for this because he takes Earthquakes very easily and he can just heal up that damage he took while simultaneously taking down Whiskash with Giga Drain. What surprised me here though was that Whiskash actually survived the Giga Drain and hit another Earthquake. While I wasn't expecting this, it ended up being pretty good for me overall as Wallace uses another full restore on Whiskash instead of on one of his scarier Pokemon. He eventually goes down to his Surf to get rid of the remaining HP, and now Wallace sends in his Tentacruel. If I recall correctly, I think I mentioned that Tentacruel can be quite tough, 
because of its great defensive typing and special bulk, with really the only clean way to deal with it is Earthquake. Well, it just so happens we have one of the best Earthquake users on our squad in Gyarados. I send him in, take a Toxic, and then swiftly take out the Jellyfish with an Earthquake. While we didn't take a lot of direct damage from that, the badly poisoned status effect is going to make it so Gyarados won't be able to contribute much at all for the remainder of the fight. Wallace is now down to two Pokemon, and he decides to send in his Ace first, so I go with Ludicolo again to see if I can take him on one on one. Milotic does crit on the first attack, and then follows up with a Toxic, while I go for Giga Drain. It deals pretty decent damage, and I do heal for a bit, but I'm gonna have to use Rest here to remove the poison, and I do. My HP is healed to full, and my Chestoberry pops, giving me a free heal essentially. And from here, I'm looking to see if I can take him down with Giga Drains. Now, after my Lodic Citrus Berry procs, I decide to go for Surf and Ice Beam first before I use Giga Drain again. This is so I don't bring my Lodic low enough that Wallace would want to use a full restore on it. Once I think I'm finally in the range that I need in order for Giga Drain to kill, I use it and my Lodic goes down. A crit from that last Ice Beam would have been scary, but I don't think it would have killed anyway in this case. Wallace's final Pokemon comes out, and now it's time for Breloom to bring this one home. Breloom is just so goddamn good against this thing, and even if you don't use Breloom for anything else in this entire league, he's worth a spot on your league team specifically to deal with this Ludicolo. Ludicolo is just so annoying to bring down with that double team slash Giga Drain combo, and Leech Seed for that matter. But Breloom is the perfect encounter for this. He resists every single one of Ludicolo's attacks and is immune to that Leech Seed. Several Sludge Bombs later, and Wallace's final Pokemon falls. And with that, this series is now over. For those of you that have been watching from the very beginning, thank you for following me on this journey. I really hope that you found this series to be entertaining, but also helpful in some way. I really hope that you were able to learn something new. In the beginning of this final episode, you may have noticed that I had said, the road from Gen 3 Casual to Emerald Master continues instead of ends. And that's because my work is long from being done here. While this run was overall very, very clean, I still made a bunch of mistakes that I simply wasn't punished for, and I still have a lot to learn and a lot to discover. With a basic hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Emerald under my belt for this channel, it's time to move on to other more complex and more difficult challenges. You guys have been so awesome with this challenge, and I can only hope that I see you in the next one. In the meantime, as always, please like the video if you liked it, and subscribe for more content like this. And let me know what other kinds of challenges you would like to see me try in the future. That's it from me. I'll see you next time.